developments of the first day of the war in the Pacific had placed the United States Army forces in the Far East in a precarious position, as not only did Japanese air raids on the Philippines leave MacArthur's primary tool of preventing the Japanese invasion, his flying fortresses wrecked at Clark Field, but also the bulk of the fleet that was supposed to bring reinforcements lay shattered at the bottom of Pearl Harbor. And now, as the Japanese removed any doubt that they had no intention of bypassing the archipelago, the Philippine garrison, virtually entirely surrounded, was left completely on their own, without any other option but to get ready for the inevitable invasion. In the following days, to further materialize the success achieved on December 8, 1941, the Japanese continued with the repeated air raids and systematic destruction of the American air and naval forces remaining on Luzon, striking port installations in Manila Bay, and air bases at Del Carmen, Nichols and Nielsen Field that had been left untouched during the attacks on the first day. These air raids, interrupted only by periods of bad weather, caused not only heavy damage to ground installations, but also resulted in reducing the United States Far East Air Force to only a handful of serviceable P-40 fighters that were no longer able to prevent the Japanese from gaining complete air superiority over the Philippines. Furthermore, in fear that with the elimination of the Far East Air Force and without air cover, his tiny force would face almost certain destruction, Admiral Thomas C. Hart, commander of the United States Asiatic Fleet, at his discretion, following however the Navy's pre-war plan, ordered most of his ships to move south on December 8th, while following the destruction of the Navy Yard at Cavite in Manila Bay on December 10th, the rest of the fleet had left the Philippine waters to join the British and Dutch as a combined naval force in Borneo, leaving behind only a few submarines, PT boats, and other smaller surface ships to harass the Japanese amphibious force. Meanwhile, in parallel with air attacks, a Japanese invasion flotilla transporting three task forces assigned to spearhead the invasion of the Philippines steamed undetected and according to schedule towards their objective. According to the Imperial Japanese Army's daring plan, these task forces were to land in three separate areas on Luzon some 10 days before the main invasion, with the mission of taking and holding the airfields at Apari, Vigan and Legaspi that were to serve as advance bases for the planes of the 5th Air Group stationed in Formosa and from where they had to fly almost to the edge of their operational range to reach the Philippines and get back and for task to carry out this risky mission, the 14th Army Commander, General Homa Masaharu, assigned the 2nd Formosa Infantry Regiment of the 48th Division under Colonel Toru Tanaka, further divided into two task forces named after their commanders, designated as Tanaka and Kano Detachment, that were to land on northern Luzon, and to the 33rd Infantry Regiment from the 16th Division, led by the division's commanding officer of infantry group, General Naoki Kimura, which was to land at Legaspi, southeast of Manila. Neither one of those advance landing detachments, which, with attached support units and engineers, numbered roughly 2,000 men, was strong enough to withstand a determined counterattack from even a single Philippine division. But regardless of risk, the Japanese planners hoped to catch the defenders off guard and that these task forces would hold their ground until main invasion begins. But even before landings on Luzon, the first Japanese troops set foot on Philippine soil on the opening day of the war, at the dawn of December 8th, when some 490 men from a temporarily organized naval landing unit came ashore unopposed on Bataan Island in Luzon Strait, about halfway between Formosa and Luzon, where they seized the airfield, finding it to be in poor condition and barely suitable for fighter and reconnaissance planes. Two days later, on December 10th, the elements of this same attack force occupied Kamiguin Island further south, where the engineers quickly established a seaplane base. At the first light of dawn on the same day, December 10th, the convoys with Tanaka and Kano detachment reached their positions off North Luzon's coast near Vigan and Apari without having sighted a single American aircraft during the entire trip. Under cover of fighter planes from Formosa and protected by one light cruiser and several destroyers, the Tanaka detachment formed out of the regimental headquarters, the 2nd Battalion and half of the 1st Battalion and with other engineer and supporting units attached, began landing over the high seas and strong wind, unopposed.
Due to poor weather conditions, only two infantry companies made it to shore at Apari, while the rest of the Tanaka detachment sailed some 35 kilometers east, where they disembarked in the area that provided partial protection from the heavy surf. Yet, even such a small force of only two Japanese companies that had landed at Apari was sufficient to persuade the city's garrison, which consisted of a single company from the 3rd Battalion of the 12th Infantry Regiment from the 11th Philippine Division, commanded by a young reserve officer, Lieutenant Alvin C. Hadley, to after sending a report about the Japanese invasion to battalion headquarters at Tugegarao, retreat south without firing a shot. However, the more spirited response came from the American Air Force when, in the morning, two B-17s appeared over the Japanese fleet while unloading was in full swing. The first plane dropped its bombs over the transport area before being driven off by the Japanese fighter aircraft, while the second B-17, piloted by Captain Colin Kelly, attacked and allegedly scored a direct hit on a large warship mistakenly identified as Battleship Haruna, even though, at that point, there were no battleships anywhere near the Philippine waters. On return to Clark Field, a squadron of Japanese Zeros intercepted Kelly's plane and inflicted severe damage to a lone bomber, but despite continuous attacks, Kelly remained at the bomber's controls long enough for his crew to bail out safely before the plane exploded while he was still in it. His action made him the first United States Air Force hero of the war, and in recognition of his bravery, he was posthumously awarded the Distinguished Service Cross. These airstrikes failed, however, to seriously threaten the Japanese landings, and by 1 p.m., the Tanaka detachment was ashore. Before nightfall, they had reached Apari, completing their primary mission of capturing the airfield where construction troops and air service units moved in immediately, and began to extend the airfields, establish depots, and ready the airstrip for operations. Simultaneously, with the landing at Apari, the Kano detachment formed out of the 3rd Battalion, and the rest of the 1st Battalion began unloading along the coast near Vigan under far worse weather conditions than in northern Luzon, which made it possible for only a fraction of the Japanese force to get ashore that morning. But despite their small number, these men managed to occupy the town by 10.30 a.m., and just as at Apari, the only American response came from the air when at about 6 a.m., not long after being spotted by a reconnaissance plane patrolling along Luzon's western shore, this task force came under attack by the five B-17s escorted by several P-40s, which in combination with rough seas prevented any further Japanese landings of troops and supplies for the rest of the day. These sporadic air attacks of December 10th, which resulted in the sinking of one Japanese minesweeper and the damaging of two transport vessels and a few warships, represented the last coordinated effort of the Far East Air Force, as well as the only attempt to disrupt the initial invasion since neither General MacArthur nor General Jonathan Wainwright, commander of North Luzon Force, made any other effort to mount a counterattack or at least to harass the small Japanese task forces that had just come ashore on the Philippines. Instead, although correctly assuming that the landings at Apari and Vigan were secondary attacks aimed at acquiring airfields on Luzon and diversions intended to draw and spread the American forces, they both strived to gather their largely dispersed units and consolidate their defenses, anticipating the main Japanese invasion to come, most likely in the Lingayen Gulf, from where the invaders had a shortest route that runs directly to Manila. Therefore, Wainwright ordered the 11th Division to pull back from northern Luzon and take up the position in a mountainous area between San Fernando and Nagilian to defend Lingayan Gulf and to block Route 3 to prevent the Kano and Tanaka detachments from moving south. The Philippine Scouts 26th Cavalry Regiment served as the mobile reserve to the 11th Division, which had been reinforced by the 71st Infantry Regiment of the 71st Philippine Division, while the 21st Division took the position south of Lingayan and the 31st Division was north of Subic Bay. Meanwhile, on December 11th, the remainder of the Kano detachment finally got ashore some six kilometers north of their assigned landing beach, and after regrouping at the coast, the bulk of the detachment proceeded towards Vigan, while a small force went some 80 kilometers north to occupy Laowag and the adjacent airfield, which they did by the following evening. By then, Kano and Tanaka detachments had established a firm foothold on Luzon and control over airfields at Apari, Vigan, and Lawag, 
which, although in poor condition, soon become operational bases for fighter planes of the 5th Air Group. Surprised by the complete absence of any American and Filipino resistance on a mission that was supposed to be suicidal, Colonel Tanaka ordered his detachment to head south, and by December 12th, they had reached Tugegarao Airfield, some 80 kilometers south of Apari, from where the 3rd Battalion of the 11th Philippine Division had already withdrawn. Thus, encouraged by the success achieved so far, Tanaka decided to leave only small garrisons to hold the seized airfields and send the bulk of his force to march around the northern tip of Luzon along Route 3 to Vigan to link up with the Kano detachment and then the reformed 2nd Formosa Infantry Regiment would proceed south along the Route 3 towards Lingayen Gulf to support the main landings of the 14th Army. In the meantime, the Japanese operation moved on. In the early morning of December 12th, the 3rd Japanese Task Force, composed of the 33rd Infantry Regiment from the 16th Division, also known as Kimura Detachment, named after its commander, with approximately 2,000 men, reinforced by the 1st Kure Special Naval Landing Force with 575 men and protected by one light cruiser and several destroyers, with close air support provided by the planes from the aircraft carrier Ryujo, began landing near Legaspi in southeast Luzon, and by 9 a.m. they were already in control of the town and airfield without encountering any resistance. Once Legaspi was firmly in his hands, General Naoki Kimura ordered his force to advance northwest towards Laman Bay, where the rest of the 16th Division was supposed to land ashore within days, and as Kimura detachment pushed north on December 17th, the leading patrol ran into a demolition detachment of the 51st Engineer Battalion from the 51st Philippine Division, working on a bridge near Naga in an attempt to cover the division's withdrawal, which led to a minor skirmish. Brief clashes between patrols of advancing Japanese and retreating men of the 51st Division continued in the following days. Now that the Japanese had made three landings on Luzon, and as no one knew where they would strike next, rumors began to spread about their invasions all over the archipelago, whilst Filipino civilians saw the danger everywhere. And as the ill-prepared Philippine army, still in the process of mobilization with limited armored forces, inadequate artillery, and no anti-tank weapons, had to control the vast coastal area with little hope for rapid reinforcement as signals from Washington had made it clear that there was no point in sending more resources to a lost cause. In these circumstances, on December 15th, General Louis Brereton, commander of a Far East Air Force, requested to move the remaining B-17s based at Del Monte Field on Mindanao to Darwin in northwest Australia. After securing MacArthur's approval on December 17th, 10 flyable bombers had reached Bachelor Field outside Darwin, and following evacuation to Australia, the Far East Air Force's strength on Luzon consisted of only 20 operational fighters. This evacuation was pulled off at the last moment, since only three days later, on December 20th, the Miura Detachment, made of the elements of the 33rd Infantry Regiment from the 16th Division and the Sakaguchi Detachment formed of the reinforced 146th Infantry Regiment from the 56th Japanese Infantry Division, with the combined strength of more than 5,000 soldiers, came ashore at Davao in Mindanao in the southern Philippines. The 56th Division, which had arrived from Palau Islands, was under 16th Army control, and this action was part of a much broader operation intended primarily to provide bases for the Japanese drive on Borneo, though it was an integral part of the 14th Army's plan of seizing the Philippines. At 4 a.m., the Japanese troops came ashore along the coast on both sites of Davao, defended by the 2nd Battalion of the 101st Regiment from the 101st Philippine Division, which offered some minor resistance before pulling back along the road leading northwest into the hills, and by 3 p.m., the city and its airfield were occupied. The Japanese failed, however, to use the momentum to seize the entire Mindanao, including Del Monte Field, as a few days later, the Sakaguchi detachment departed to Jolo Island and further to Borneo, following the narrow timetable of the broader Japanese plan, leaving the Mura detachment at Davao. The first phase of the Japanese operation in the Philippines had been surprisingly successful, exceeding all expectations, even among the most optimistic ones. 
Not only did they now, after four landings at separate points, establish a strong presence in Luzon and Mindanao and had control over several airfields, but in less than two weeks, they had successfully driven the United States Air Force and Navy out of the archipelago. And, for the doomed Philippine garrison, the worst was still to come.